And good morning, everyone. It's really nice to be with all of you this morning, even remotely, to have so many New Hampshire um, folks on the line with Congressman Pappas and me as we introduce legislation that I think is very important. It's really legislation that came from what we were hearing from people in New Hampshire, um, those groups that Director Buck works with so closely that can, um, that really are the people who are working in our veteran cemetery in New Hampshire. What our legislation would do is give state veteran cemeteries the option of bearing guard and reserve members and their spouses, um, even if they have not been called up to active duty. Right now, under the current rules of the Department of Veterans Affairs, veteran cemeteries are not able to do that if they receive federal monies. And so this would be a change that would give state veteran cemeteries the option of doing that. And I'm really pleased to be joined this morning by Colonel Warren Perry, who is the Deputy Adjutant General in New Hampshire. Thank you for joining us, Colonel Perry, and for all of the great work that you do. You are the liaison with oversight responsibility for the veteran cemetery, and I appreciate your work on that, but also the great work that the New Hampshire Guard has done as we've been addressing the coronavirus and all of the work around the pandemic. They have just been amazing and have filled in in so many areas where we didn't have the capacity without them. I'm also really pleased to be joined by Director Sean Buck, who is the uh, Director of the Veteran Cemetery in New Hampshire and who follows in a line of people who have really taken personal care of the Veterans Cemetery. His leadership has made such a difference. And what we know about the Veterans Cemetery in New Hampshire, and I'm sure all of the reporters on this call visit there, but it's not just um, a sacred place for us to honor the men and women who have served in this nation's uniform but it also represents New Hampshire's military history in a way that is so significant to the state. And it's, I think it's only right that we are able to honor the Guard and Reserve who have served our state and our nation so honorably um, and their capacities as Guard and Reserve, even if they haven't been called up to active duty, if we have room and it's something that our volunteers and our veterans in New Hampshire want. So. I'm so pleased to be joining my colleague, Congressman Pappas, today in introducing this legislation and look forward to working with him to get it passed. So thank you, Congressman. Well, thanks very much, Senator Shaheen, for your remarks and for your work. I'm really proud to be able to partner with you on this effort. I think this is an idea whose time has come. Uh, and I'm really glad that we have um, Colonel Perry as well as Director Buck on the call with us here today to talk a little bit about their experience. I thank them for what they do for our military families and our veterans here in New Hampshire. Uh, we really support uh, those who have served this country better than any other state in the country. Um, and that's exemplified by the hallowed ground at our state veterans cemetery. So uh, Director Buck, thank you for the work that you and your team do to um, you know, maintain that facility uh, and to honor those who have given so much to our nation. Um, this is an important issue that is about equity for members of the Garden Reserve when it comes to their final resting place. Um, it's about giving them the honor and dignity that they deserve based on their service. Uh, we've seen over the last many months during this pandemic just how crucial the work is of the National Guard to our health, our security, uh, and our safety. Guard members have fielded hundreds of thousands of calls at employment security. They've um, made sure that uh, we've had additional hospital capacity and testing capacity stood up. They've been delivering food um, and distributing PPE all across the state of New Hampshire. They've truly been on the front lines of this fight against COVID um, and their selfless service in New Hampshire and in other states across the country exemplifies how they respond time and again at home and abroad. With this legislation, Senator Shaheen and I hope to further honor the significant role that Guard members and reservists play in our communities by giving them the honor of being laid to rest in a state's veteran cemetery. <clears throat> That's a privilege that we reserve for our heroes and for generations. Members of the Guard and Reserve have been called upon at home and abroad to serve in so many heroic ways. 
Um, the United States increasingly relies on the Guard Reserve as part of our military's total force. So I believe that it is only fitting that our state veteran cemeteries can allow all those who have honorably worn the uniform of this country to be interred there. So I just thank um, you know, those who have been calling for this for a long time. I've had some great conversations uh, with members of the Guard and veterans here in New Hampshire about this issue. Um, and I think that uh, we should allow our state veteran cemetery to figure out how to move forward uh, without threatening to take away uh, federal funding for such a great facility. So I urge my colleagues in the House and Senate to support this common sense bill, and hopefully we can get it to the president soon for his signature. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Colonel Perry uh, if you have some remarks. Colonel, we appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you very much, Congressman. And uh, good morning, uh, Senator Shaheen and Congressman Pappas. And Sean, welcome. I uh, didn't expect to see you this morning. Hope you're enjoying your time, time away. Uh, I, I just would like to say how proud we are of the congressional delegation and their support of this legislation. It, uh, it, it closes uh, a loophole in the current statute that, that prohibits some members of the reserve components to be buried in the cemetery. And as, as it's already been said so eloquently, it is a, a tremendous place of honor. It's a memorial. It's not a place of mourning our cemetery. It's really a place of honor. Uh, and the contributions of, you know, the members of the National Guard and the reserves in all components and all services, uh, they deserve to be recognized and honored in the same way as active uh, service members. So we are absolutely uh, uh, filled with gratitude for the support of this uh, initiative and this legislation, and we look forward to the time that it gets passed. Uh, you know, currently, currently our Guard continues to support uh, in New Hampshire, the response uh, to the COVID crisis. Uh, and we've, we've, we've really proven uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt our worth to the state of New Hampshire. And it, that deserves to be recognized here. So again, thank you, Congressman Pappas. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. Uh, I think also Congre uh, Congressman Custer and Congressman Palazzo are also signed on to support this bill. We, we, uh, we uh, extend our gratitude to them as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Director Buck. Well, thanks so much for having me here, Senator Sheen, Congressman Pappas, Warren. Um, this is something that's been in the works a long time. And I, I owe a debt of thanks to my predecessors who championed this quite a bit, um, as well as members of the Guard and Reserve and members of the New Hampshire veterans community who've been real champions of this and something that I've learned about from the beginning of my time as the director. I can tell you with certainty that there are many other states, and I've talked to quite a few of them, who this is an important issue in their state as well. So it makes me proud that our state takes the lead and gets it done, because they, you know, I've talked to them, and I, you know, we said, oh, this is something we think is important. And why is it important? And I talk to a lot of veterans, because every now and again, like, somebody will come in and they'll say, well, I served during Vietnam, but I didn't go to Vietnam. And it's, they say it almost like they feel sorry. And I always tell them, no, you raised your right hand and volunteered to serve. That's the heroic action. Um, you will go where your branch of the military sends you, whether that's to combat or not. And the same holds true with the reserve and the guard. When they raise their right hand, they're raising the right hand to do what they're called to do. Sometimes they're not called to deploy federally or activate federally. That's not their choice. And so I think what this legislation does is allows us to honor the heroic act of volunteering the volunteer service of our, the volunteer force of our country relies on people doing just that. And the guard and reserves are a critical component of that. Um, in particular, you think about in state veteran cemeteries, we're honoring those who live and serve in our state. And it just seems right that we would honor them in a state veteran cemetery with burial because they raised their right hand and they said, I'll go, whether it's a state emergency or a national emergency. So thank you so, so much, because this legislation is important. I, I can't imagine we will, we will find, I think you're gonna find a lot of support among the state, state legislatures, and I will do my part. I'll start calling veteran cemeteries around the country and tell them, look, this is out there, call your congressmen, call your senators, and make sure that they get on board with this. So thank you so, so much. It's overdue, but it's time. And thank you for making it happen now. And who would, we expect it, it's New Hampshire, we made it happen. Well, thanks so much, Sean, and thank you for that explanation, because I think that really does say it in a way that everybody can understand. 
And um, we're going to need you to call all those directors of veteran cemeteries across the country, right, Chris, in order to get all of our colleagues on board to get this passed. So thank you. I think we're all um, available to answer any questions that members of the press who are on the call might have. Yeah, please feel free to just unmute yourself and ask your question and then remember to mute back um, afterwards. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, this is Sean Wickham from the Union Leader. Good morning, Senator. Good morning, Congressman. Good morning, Sean. Hey, Sean. Hi, Sean. Um, Colonel, um, my question was, if you don't mind, if someone could just be a little more specific and explain what currently prohibits that. I know there are rules. I know it has to do with the VA funding, but hey, Sean, if you could um, just a little more specifically explain why that's not happening now. if Because our guardsmen have served on the front lines in overseas, and I think they are on active deployment right now for our COVID response. So if you don't mind, somebody could explain that to me. Thanks. Yeah, Sean, um, I'll take. Sean. Go, go, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, since we're reimbursed by the Veterans Administration, we fall under the guidance of the National Cemetery Administration. Um, and according to their guidelines and regulations, members of the Guard and the Reserves are not eligible for internment in a veterans in a state or national veterans cemetery unless they have been called to active orders, federal active orders, not state active orders. Um, so oftentimes we have applicants who've served, you know, maybe they served five, seven, eight years in the National Guard, and the only time they're activated was for training. They went to their basic training, and that was the only time they're on active duty. They are not eligible, even though they served honorably for a period of time in the National Guard or the reserves. Um, and the, the reason I can't, we can't allow them as the state veteran cemeteries is that we put at risk our funding of, from the federal government, from the National Cemetery Administration, the Veterans Administration. They, the, the National Cemetery Administration falls under the Veterans Administration. Um, so that's why this legislation is so important. We're not asking the Veterans Administration for more money to bury these folks. We're asking them to allow us as a state to make the decision to have those folks buried, and we'll figure that out. Every state will figure out how they're going to do that, whether they're going to charge a fee or whether the state's going to pay for it. That'll be left up to the state. And I think that's what's important about this is the VA certainly isn't going to kick in all the extra, because we get reimbursed, and just in case you didn't know, Sean, we're reimbursed from the Veterans Administration for each veteran burial we do at the New Hampshire State Veterans Cemetery. Um, so we put at risk those funds if we don't follow their guidelines. This is allowing us the flexibility to still receive those funds and to honor state, uh, those that are in the National Guard and Reserves who aren't otherwise qualified for this veteran's benefit, because that's what the burial in a veteran cemetery is. It's a veteran's benefit given through the VA. Did, did that answer your question? It's long. Yes, no, that's great. Thank you, sorry, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> no, that's great. Okay, so, so in other words, just to clarify, the folks who went over with the fires brigade, they that was a federal activation so they would be eligible but it may be the folks who have served in you know the search and rescue um and, and found hikers on top of mountains they wouldn't be eligible is that the sort of a clarification absolutely correct that's exactly you're right got it thank you other questions hi peter biello here from nhpr Hi, Peter. You, okay, good. You can hear me. Wasn't sure. Thank you very much for, for having this Zoom call. For, and I'm sorry I was a little bit late. Um, do you happen to know how many uh, veterans this might impact in New Hampshire in a given year? Are there lots of requests that come in for this kind of thing? And do you have to consistently tell them, no, you can't do this? I don't have an exact number, but I would say an annual basis is probably not going to be a significant number. We've probably got a uh, couple hundred that we have in a file that we've t said no, um, but we tell them that um, that if this legislation changed, we'll reach back out and tell you that it's changed. But I don't think that captures the whole number because I think a lot of people have heard and they, don't, they just don't even apply. We don't get their applications. I would say I turn down uh, probably a couple, three applications a month um, because of this specific um, regulation that they, they, they were in the guard, they apply, I get the application and we say no. Um, unfortunately, you're not eligible because you weren't on active duty for any period of time other than any period of time other than uh, training. Um, so it, it's probably, if I were going to venture a guess, it's less than 100 people a year for sure. Um, I, I, I would venture, I guess, you know, 40, 50 people a year, maybe. Now that doesn't include spouses. So, you know, I'm kind of thinking about in terms of those who actually apply. So 
Um, so that's that's just a kind of a swag on my part, honestly, Peter. But that's somewhere that's probably in the ballpark. Okay, thank you. And and just to clarify, uh, this particular legislation would allow the rule change, but the state of New Hampshire, the legislature here would have to also make that make that a thing. Um. Well, it's correct that this would allow it. It doesn't mandate it for states and veteran cemeteries. So however those states would make that decision um, is up to them. Thank you. It looks like we have some questions being typed into the chat from uh, Andrew from Manchester Inklink. Um, and Senator, I'll read the first one. It says for yourself and um, myself, have you heard of or believe anyone in the House or Senate who would be opposed to this legislation? Um, and what I'll say is I, I think that um, this does represent a change. Um, and I think this might be a difficult subject for some, but in the personal conversations that I've had with uh, members, especially of my House Veterans Affairs Committee, um, it seems like we can develop some good bipartisan support behind this proposal, um, especially as everyone appreciates so much the role that uh, the Garden Reserve play um, in our state. So I, I think this is an idea that uh, we have to continue to push out there, uh, but we're gonna, we expect to gain considerable support for it. Um, I certainly agree with that, Chris. You know, it's sometimes you never know what people um, are, how people are gonna respond. I remember co-sponsoring the original legislation to create the veteran cemetery in New Hampshire back when I was in the state Senate. And, we didn't get it done the first couple of times we tried to do it because there were, um, you know, it's, it's also about explaining to people how it would work, um, helping them understand that this is not a mandate, this is something that um, their veteran cemetery, their state can weigh in and make the decision on. Um, so I can't imagine in the end that there would be any real opposition, but it's a process and, and so one of the things we will need to do is to engage in that process and um, Chris and I will be working closely to try and talk to our colleagues and as I said, we're gonna need um, directors of cemeteries across the country that Sean can talk to and veterans groups and, and I know Colonel Perry and um, General Nicolaides will also be helpful as we're talking to other guards and reserves across the country about um, this change to really accommodate the service and the sacrifice that so many of our members in the Guard and Reserve um, provide to their communities, to their states, and to our country. It looks like his second question is, would this require additional veteran cemeteries in the future? Maybe, Sean, you could speak to uh, what you just talked about a little bit in terms of the numbers of individuals that might be uh, requesting uh, burial and you know, whether or not you can meet the, the demand? Well, the answer is certainly yes. Um, it's way in the future for New Hampshire. Um, and so that's, those are the types of things each state's gonna have to take into account. Um, again, I don't think the numbers are so significant. So we have roughly 41,000 more burial plots at least in our land for the New Hampshire State Veterans Cemetery. So we're covered at the current burial rate till about 2093, 2095, somewhere in that area. So obviously if this legislation passes, that number will run out a little sooner. Um, so yeah, at some point in the future, it will require more land. Um, but there are other ways I think to mitigate that um, in terms of, at least in New Hampshire, what we're seeing is the proponents of our burials are cremations, 80% um, roughly at this point are. So therefore the numbers are gonna extend longer because obviously we can, handle a lot more cremation burials than full casket burials. Um, so all kinds of legislation can change going forward to extend the life of a cemetery. Um, but again, that's why we leave it up to the state. The states are gonna have to decide, these are the types of things each state will have to look at and say, well, if, if we're gonna do this, what's the cost to us going to be? Um, and that's exactly where it should go. The, 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 the state veteran cemetery is something that the states have raised their hand. Thank you, Senator Shaheen, for your work when you were in the state legislature um, to honor our veterans this way, our state wants to honor our veterans with a state veteran cemetery. Not, there are states that don't have any. There are several states that only have national veteran cemeteries. So we should be proud of that. Um, and every state has the chance to do the same thing. So I hope that answers your question. So the answer to your question is certainly, we're gonna, end, we're gonna have more burials. So it will require a new cemetery at some point in our state. 
Thank you. Uh, so I know we are running up against a, a, a time uh, constraint here. Does anybody have any other questions about the this legislation before we, I know, um, uh, Kristen, you had a question about, about testing, but are there any other questions with regards to this bill before we move on? So if you don't mind, real quickly, if I could get the spelling for um, Colonel Perry, I just want to spell you right. <laughs> so it's uh, Warren, W-A-R-R-E-N, mm -hmm. Perry, P like pizza, E-R-R-Y. Thank you. That was my guess, but you never want to guess wrong. <laughs> thank, thank you, sir. All right. All right, Kristen, you have a question? Okay, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Congressman Pappas and, and Senator Shaheen, please feel free to either one of you answer these questions, but we really want to talk to you guys about testing. Um, just how big the backlog of testing is nationwide and what is currently being looked at to address that. You know, Kristen, I was in Concord at the National Guard testing site last week. And one of the things I heard was that the request for tests has picked up and that the time that it takes for us to get the results of those tests has increased. And that one of the reasons it's increased is because they are sending tests from um, a number of the hot spots in the South and the West where we are seeing a dramatic increase in uh, the cases of coronavirus. And they're sending the tests to the Northeast because we have not had as many tests. So, it presents a real challenge for us as we think about how we provide the testing that people in New Hampshire need. And it's why we have got to, in the next round of legislation to address uh, the coronavirus that is pending in the Senate, and it's unfortunate that it has taken us so long to take up what the House passed over a month ago. Um, but we need to provide additional help to states for testing. We need a plan to do that. It's unfortunate. We've known we had this problem since February, and yet we still don't have a national plan to address that testing. So that needs to be part of what is in this next package. We need to get this done as soon as possible. We need to get the help that people in New Hampshire and across the country need, not just to address testing, but to address so much of the economic fallout and the concerns that people have who are losing their unemployment benefits, who are worried about getting evicted, and so we have got to act, and that needs to be a piece of what we do. And Senator, how much money is being considered right now, and where would it directly go to help with expanded testing? Well, there was, um, I think, $3 trillion, is that right, Chris, in the HEROES Act that the House passed. Um, Mitch McConnell in the Senate is only talking about a $1 trillion in his package. I think as we look at the testing piece, we're still putting together that plan, um, but in the last package, we gave 25 billion to go to help with testing. And um, so New Hampshire got about 61 million of that, I think. And it's clear that states continue to need help. And just my last question is, um, you know, as schools start to reopen, obviously we may see an uptick in, in testing for students and teachers and staff and all of that. Um, are you hearing concerns from, from, from school administrators about this? You know, are they looking for additional money to deal with what potentially is on the horizon for them? Well, absolutely. What I'm hearing is that, um, again, I was in Rochester last week um, visiting and with the school officials there. And what they told me is that about 70% of parents and teachers want to go back to school. They want the kids back in school, they understand it's important for them. But in order to do that and to do that safely, they need help. And they need help for us at the federal level. So as again, as we're putting together this package, I know it's something that the House um, put significant dollars to help schools with reopening. And Chris, you may want to speak to that. But I hope we can take what the House has done and make sure that we're providing the help that school districts are going to need, not just for um, mass for tests for um, filtration systems so that um, there is ventilation for um, air coming in and out of schools. Uh, again, one of the examples that they gave me in Rochester is that they have a thousand employees in the Rochester School District. 
just to provide each of them with a mask would be 5,000 masks a week. And the costs of that are significant, personal protective equipment. So we've got to provide help at the federal level to ensure that if our kids are going to be able to get back to school, that they can do it safely, that the districts have the help they need. Chris, do well, you want I'll to add to Yeah. Sure, I'll just add, and I agree with what the Senator said. Uh, two months ago, we passed uh, uh, the next coronavirus relief package, which contains significant support for testing, tracing, and treatment, as well as support for our schools to be able to meet the increased costs of uh, sanitizing, of putting up barriers, of spacing desks apart, and having the PPE they need to keep educators and kids and their families safe. Um, so the news is alarming about the increased lag in getting testing results. If we can't get a result in short fashion, then we put more individuals at risk. Um, and the testing has to be combined with contact tracing uh, and with availability of treatment um, so that we're containing and mitigating COVID and we're ultimately reducing the rate. You know, I've been uh, alarmed at how the president has referred to testing as a double-edged sword when it is in fact the best tool we have to lower infection rates um, to make sure that uh, we're identifying COVID early and staying ahead of it. Now we happen to have better numbers in New Hampshire than other parts of this country but that doesn't mean we don't have a testing need. Uh, we need to keep it that way by staying vigilant and making sure that the testing resources are still there, that we have good plans in place to safely reopen our schools and to ensure that our public health um, efforts continue to go forward. So we all have a role to play uh, and we all have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, there's a great testing need. We continue to need to see a, a federal strategy um, that uh, results in, in quicker uh, diagnoses of COVID. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can arrive at that through the next package. Me too. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you all very much. Yeah, really appreciate you your, your participation and uh, we'll stay in touch. And Sean and Colonel Perry, we will call on you to help us here. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thanks. It's nice to be with you. Thanks for your work. Thank you all. Take care. Take Have a great day. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you, everybody.